Okay, yeah, this is uh, my second talk, and I've, um, I'm deviating slightly from the, the mandate I was given by Patricia. Um, so I'll talk about the top mass and, and top electrical couplings. Um, so let, let's start. Right, we, we now have, our, our top is still our favorite quark, I think, but we have this new particle in the game and it's, it's drawing everyone's attention much more than the top is. But, that, but I think there is a, a very good physics case to be made for top measurements at a lepton collider. It's never been done, and uh, I think it has a very good potential. And I'll, I'll, I'll go th through some of the studies that we've done at the ILC and CLIC. Um, so in a few lines, red top is the only quark that we didn't have a chance to study in, in a previous lepton collider directly. Uh, the top quark mass has come up several times in this workshop as an important parameter for the fate of the universe, for the electroweak fits. It comes in a lot of loops uh, in Higgs coupling, so it's a, a parametric uncertainty on many calculations. Uh, so we need to measure that as precisely as we can. Um, and as I said, we can measure couplings to neutral electroweak bosons for the first time. We produce, of course, the process at the Tevatron and the LHC, but we have not been able to isolate it uh, in any meaningful way. So this will really be the first time that we, that we see a diagram like this one. Of course, the LHC can access couplings between tops and photons and Zs through associated production, TT bar gamma and TT bar Z, and we have seen a few events uh, of those. Slowly, we're getting cross-section indications, I would say, for now. And then, uh, at some point, we'll, we'll be able to derive constraints on new physics from this. So with a lepton collider, depending on the energy we run at, we get quite copious production of, of top quark pairs. The, the peak of this distribution is between 400 and 500 GeV. It ramps up qu pretty quickly here at the threshold. I'll go into that region in a bit more detail later. And then it falls off as an S channel does. Um, there is a, a subtlety here in the sense that TT bar is this dotted line here, and the red continuous line is the WBWB production that we really see. We can try to confirm that there are really two tops in that event by cutting very hard on masses, energies, etc. But before we get to a pure TT bar production, we, we, we have to deal with diagrams that have a single top or even no tops at all, but do result in the same final state. So that fraction can be quite substantial. Here about half of the events that we start with is actually not TT bar. Um, I think we'll end up measuring WBWB and calculating WBWB and comparing those at, at some level. It's very hard to experimentally cleanly separate these processes. And even at the physics level, they're, they're untangled. Right, a, a basic asset of lepton colliders is that we can calculate production rates to a precision that we can't dream of at the LHC. Right? We, we, we have a 5% uncertainty on the TT bar cross-section at the LHC now. It's a major step forward with the NNLO calculation. At the lepton collider, that should be easy. So this is around 500 GeV. We've tried to estimate next to leading order, next to next to leading order, and, and cubed corrections. And, and it, it really goes down to per middle level. Uh, so we, we can match this with the luminosity estimate. We've heard that before. We can really get absolute rates to, to the per mil level. There are some caveats again. The theorists shouldn't just rest. Uh, there are electroweak corrections that are sizable, as they were for WW production, for instance. Uh, and they haven't been calculated at the two loop level. Um, uh, but I think we can safely claim that, that this precision is something we'll never reach at the LHC. So the threshold is a special region, we know there is this semi-bound state where Coulomb effects QCD corrections 
give a, a sort of a peak, which is then washed out by, by experimental effects, ISR, beam strahlung. So this is true with all machines. There's a slight difference in exactly the extent to which this happens. Um, calculations exist of, of this peak to, to quite good precision. And people are working now on matching those calculations with a continuum calculation, doing this for WB, WB rather than TT bar and introducing all that in a generator. So of course we won't get the n cubed low in a generator anytime soon, but there are reliable predictions from a generator of the threshold region, and I hope soon they will match on to the, um, to the continuum calculation. It, it's still a, a special region in the sense that many corrections are very large in that region. You get parametric uncertainties from the top mass, from the top width, of course, right? That, that's why we have sensitivity to these quantities there. But for other studies, these may be a problem. So I think one should keep in mind that the threshold region has its issues in terms of predictability. So then, in a one slide summary of the studies that exist, right, the, the threshold and the mass extraction at threshold have been studied in quite some detail. We've had studies, and I'm one of the authors for these, uh, at 500 GeV of TT bar Z and TT bar Photon and at higher energies. Not so relevant here. We can get TT bar Higgs. So let's start with mass, right? We had a bit of a milestone in the sense that we had the first global combination of top quark masses. We've reached 700 MeV, that's already come down to 600. It all makes sense, right? all measurements seems to agree with each other, even slightly too well at this point. Um, there are prospects that I won't go into because that's not worth what we're discussing today. Right? Estimates of how well the LHC can do in the future vary from 200 MeV to about five, 600, right? But some people will claim that we're already saturated by issues with the interpretation at this level. At threshold, right, the position where this, this peak happens, where this ramp up is, is, is happening, depends very strongly on the top quark mass. But the shape also depends on the set of other parameters. The width is shown here. Uh, there can be a Higgs exchange here, so it depends on the top Yukawa uh, too, and alpha S is an important parameter. So some studies have actually extracted four, these four parameters in one fit of several distributions, not just the, 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 the cross section. Um, we know since 1981, and I think that's pretty impressive, that, that this is one of the most promising ways to, to, to extract a top quark mass. It, it can be done very cleanly, both experimentally, theoretically. Um, so there have been several studies, and they get repeated every few years. Um, this is Martinez and Miguel in 2003, so this is the four parameter fit I mentioned. Uh, these are confirmed by a study that is both more sophisticated in terms of the experimental studies that they performed, but a bit less sophisticated in its fit. Um, but they find essentially the same results. And then there's a new study that includes polarization, and they fit for the width and the mass, fixing alpha s with some external value that they'll get somewhere. So we've we made some progress trying to understand what precision we get. The statistical error is somewhere between 16 and 34 MeV in all these studies. We can improve this more or less at will, I think, right? Um, we could run for two years and then you get a factor square of two and there are things you can do here. Um, People have checked that it doesn't really matter which points you pick. As long as you cover that, that, that onset region, you'll, you'll get a, a good number out. Some background studies, rough estimates, give you an 18 MeV. Precision on the square root of S assumed at 10 to the minus 4 give you 30 MeV error. So that's non-trivial uh, compared to the statistical error. The luminosity spectrum, the latest studies in the 
ILC and click uh, give us 10 MeV or so. The uncertainty on the theory cross-section where just an, a normalization uncertainty is taken into account is a few MeV. Um, and then there's this red line, which is the, the main component of an error. We want to translate the mass that we extract, which is typically the 1S mass. You can, you, you can use different definitions. But right, all the masses that are close to the actual peak position uh, have a similar precision in extrapolating to the MS bar mass, which is what we want. We want to insert this into calculations, and we need a well-defined mass. So this is a penalty of 100 MeV. And that might be improved by getting a better value of alpha s that, that goes in there again and calculating more loops. And it's very hard to get theorists to pronounce on how much this can come down in 10 years, given a few million euros. Um, so right, this is something that we should all work on. And if you compare this to the numbers that have been floated by FCCEE, right, there's a target of 10 MeV, which we should compare directly to these numbers. Right, the statistical uncertainty we know can, can be made small. But I think all the labs and colliders together should work on reducing that number. It would be a pity if we're dominated by a, a theory uncertainty in the end. Right, we also get alpha s to a non-competitive precision, uh, the width to something that is useful. And the Yukawa coupling, if you insert a very precise value of alpha s, you can get this number to a precision of a few percent, which is not bad. OK, now to the, the content that I was supposed to give, the top core couplings. Um, if I summarize the study in one slide again, we measure four observables. We have two polarizations for the beams. We measure cross-section and forward backward symmetry in both cases. And then we can extract a number of these form factors that get into the, the most general Lagrangian that you can write down. We can't extract them all at the same time, uh, but we do it in pairs. Um, it's, it's very hard to, to really constrain uh, the whole system. And these are, these are not all form factors that you can write down. So we need to measure more observable, uh, identify more ways to constrain this if we really want to get values for all of the form factors at the same time. With the assumptions that are listed here, we would get this for the LHC, and there are large uncertainty on that number. It's very hard to get the LHC collaborations to put out any prospects. So this is an old study. We know it will come down by at least a factor two. But still, a, a lepton collider Right, from looking at the diagram, you could have guessed, will do, do very much better than, than the Hadron Colliders. One important point is that to do this, to disentangle the photon and the Z boson form factors, we, we need polarization. Right, once you've measured these four, we can, we can get numbers for photon and Z form factors at the same time. So this can then be translated into a, a new physics reach when one can look at different models that will predict deviations from the top right and top left coupling. Um, these can be quite sizable still. They're not constrained all that well by existing data. And a lepton collider could identify a small circle here and rule out a whole set of models, or at least move its scale up quite substantially. So one of the things I was asked to talk about is how, how does this depend? You've studied that at 500 GeV. What would change if I did it at a TeV or at 380? Or, right? and what, what is the square root of S dependence of that story? And naively, you would expect, well, if I, if I build a higher energy collider, I can reach higher energy scales for the new physics. And there are some examples of concrete models where that is true. If I assume the same precision on the cross-section and the forward-backward asymmetry, I get higher Z prime scales um, with a 3 TeV collider than with a 1 TeV collider and a similar luminosity. And even the luminosity we know scales with, with energy to some extent. So that, that seems like an, 
like, like, a, like a good answer, but it, it's a bit more complex in reality. So what we've done is, right, we know these form factors are related to effective operators. Uh, one can identify the full set of dimension six operators and then try to vary each of these operators and see what impact they have on, on a number of observables. So the number of observables here is limited to the cross-section and the forward-backward asymmetry. We haven't been able to go beyond that. Um, we vary each of these uh, form factors. So these are the dipole moments. This is xt, which is uh, essentially the f1 form factors, and see how much they vary at different energies. And then you get the picture like this. So there are a number of form factors the F1V and F1A essentially, that are essentially flat. It doesn't matter. As long as I get a good precision at any energy, my, my new physics reach is essentially the same. But there are others, the dipole moments in particular, that can have much larger impact on the, on the center of my, on, on the cross section or the forward backward asymmetry at 3 TeV than it would have at 1 TeV. So you can do this for, for other observables too. So we, we, we think there is a case to try and do this measurement at several center of mass energies as precisely as we can. So the next stage is looking at how precisely we can actually extract these form factors or effective operator strength at different center of mass energies. And there are surprisingly few studies of top quark reconstruction. We know it's a complex business from, from the LHC. Uh, people have done studies, this is the 500 GeV uh, approach, which is very similar to what we do at the LHC. And one gets all kinds of effects, which make top quarks harder to reconstruct than muons or electrons or even B-jets. Um, but there are migrations due to the combinatorics of the problem. We, we often assign the B-jet to the wrong W, and then this slope is, is distorted, especially for one of the polarizations. We can try to cut harder on our, on our kinematics and see if we can get this to come back to the level that we had at the generator. And we achieve that to about 2%. So th there are some real issues here. And of course, then you get into modeling, systematics, etc. At very high energy, we don't know very much. Uh, there are some exploratory studies here. We can use the boosted top paradigm, reconstruct top jets, and, and one can get a very narrow peak, even at click with the background contamination that we have there uh, at 1 TeV or 3 TeV. So I think in the long run, once we really finalize these studies, we may find that the higher the energy, the easier it gets to, to reconstruct top quark pairs. I'll skip this for the sake of speed. So we, what we've done then is to assume an integrated luminosity, assume a set of polarizations. These are numbers that are relevant for the ILC, but one could try to scale these for, for an FCC EE. Um, and then we take only the statistical uncertainties on AFB and the, the cross-section and see how well we measure each of these form factors. So typically there's a, a minimum somewhere between 400 and 500. At high energy this goes up. We'll compensate partially for this by the fact that at linear colliders the luminosity that you can get at higher energy is, is greater. So this will come down by a factor square root of two and this will come down by a square root of three. Um, blue and red dots here are the nominal beam polarization and electron polarization only. And that, that has a small effect, but we need some polarization to actually get this disentangling between photon and Z. Again, depending on which form factor is your favorite, uh, this shape changes a bit. In particular for the F1A to the Z, the rise here at, at low energy, so the lowest point is 360 and it's 380, 420 and 500. This, this is a lot steeper than it was on the previous plot and this is now actually a bit less pronounced. 
And for some other, so this is FT2V, then uh, we get a slightly different shape still. So it, it, it seems that there is a sweet spot for this measurement in a region that I've roughly indicated as 420 to 700 GeV. And if you want a, an easy explanation of that, we need the forward backward symmetry to be sizable, and that, that goes with beta at, in the threshold region. And we need the cross section to be as large as possible, and at some point it drops off. And, uh, there is an added argument there. Precise calculations 40 GeV above the, the, the threshold are going to be easier. It's hard to quantify this. We should ask a theorist to come up with a, a more quantitative answer here. But it's going to be easier to do that away from the threshold than at the threshold where many other effects come into play. Um, I've shown you that depending on which form factors you're most interested in, it, it, it might pay off. Even if we lose some precision, it might pay off to go to TEV, uh, lepton colliders. We need some polarization. And to complete the summary, right? this is my summary of the top quark mass situation. Right? If, We've often quoted this 100 MeV, which includes all the errors that we're aware of. And we should be very careful not to put it against a 10 MeV target from another machine uh, in order not to confuse people. Um, and to finalize, there, there's much more that we can explore. I've, I've given you essentially two thirds of the physics studies that have been performed in, in some detail in full simulation. and. I think there's much more to do with tops at the Lepton Collider. We simply haven't had time to, to look into it in detail. Thank you. Thank you very much. Has it been attempted to use the uh, method of extracting an MS bar top mass directly from a cross section measurement? So, not going via the threshold mass? Yeah. I've discussed this with Andre Huang once, and it, it should be possible, but I think there's a reason why you would end up with an error that's not too dissimilar from that 100 MeV. Uh, I can't tell you what You can't beat it, you think? I mean, at the LHC, we are stuck with few GV with this method, yeah? and it will probably not become better because of PDF uncertainties, etc. Yeah, but well, here, we don't have this. We've written a paper where we claim that, that extracting MS bar masses from cross sections at the LHC can get us down to an, a GV. It's a differential normalized cross section, etc. But so, and then it's true that we get smarter as we we do things. We might be able to. Right, this is again going into the discussion we're not supposed to have, but that there might be ways of actually calibrating that Monte Carlo mass to some well-defined mass to the precision that we need, and then we can use the existing measurements in all their glory. So th hey, this was LHC, but here you say... Yeah, right, I'm, I'm sure we would do it that way if, if, if it would give us a better uncertainty. Um, but uh, yeah, I can't tell you what the reason is why uh, directly extracting the MS bar mass from the, from the, from the shape oh, uh, has a larger yeah. error than than extracting the 1s mass. Obviously, numerically, it's much further away, right? The 1s mass is right at the threshold, while the MS bar mass is, is 10 GV away. But I'm not sure if that, that's a good enough reason. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah. I have two comments, one on the top quark mass. I think we know the uh, JSI mass to seven or eight significant digits, and we don't know the charm mass to better than 20%. Here, it's a, I think it's a similar issue. We should, be, we should try to factorize the experimental problem, which is the measurement of the 1S state. Okay, so sort of try to define a pseudo-observable, which is the top threshold, and then let the theorists do their cooking on relating that quantity to the radiative questions and all the rest, so that we don't get you know, to, to another observable, uh, measurable thing, because MS bar things are not measurable. They're just, um, you yes know. Yes and no, because there's, 
but we know we need a mask that we can plug into all the uh, calculations, right? In the, the yeah. running of, of Lambda and into the electroweak fit. And we, we need a well-defined mass. So at some point, there's limited use in knowing some not so well-defined mass to a few MeV if you can't make a well-defined mass out of it to, to better precision. Right, but uh, anyway, uh, the second comment I have is that the top decays with a weak interaction, Ws, and I'm sure we can measure the top polarization from the final state. And in that case, I think the same information should be there as from the initial state polarization, if we know how to do it. Yeah. And, we, and this, since that decay is 100%, just about, uh, top to B, W, I think we should be able to, maybe probably at the loss, at the cost of some loss in precision, but we should be but able it, to it, go around the problem. Quite substantial, the loss in precision, I think. Right? We, we, we've done the, the top coupling study initially, we, we were measuring the top polarization or the elasticity angle slope. And you, we don't think we can do that very precisely. So we were claiming we could do that to 4%, which is a lot worse than you can know the initial state polarization. Right? That, that, that could be per middle level. Right? So there is a, a penalty there. But I, th I think it's an interesting idea. We should try to, to work out more quantitatively. So this is uh, a little bit off topic, but I'd just like to advertise another top measurement that I think would be interesting which is uh, CP violation in the TT bar Higgs vertex. So we heard earlier on about the interest in measuring CP violation in the Higgs tau tau vertex. And I think the top is the other case where you can imagine doing something. And uh, well, we wrote a paper uh, a year or so back about how you could attack this at the LHC. But I think it might be worth thinking also for E plus E minus colliders, how could you at attack this issue? You have to go to TT bar Higgs production, or is there another way to tackle it? Well, that, that's the obvious uh, way to go, and, and there's all sorts of kinematic things that you can do, I think, to you know, pick out the uh, CP odd part of the vertex if there is one. Uh, but I'm also wondering uh, you know, whether there might be some impact on the uh, bound states, but I haven't thought about it at all. Last questions? Yes, if we change the TTZ uh, coupling by 1%, which is the precision that you're mentioning, uh, this would also change the uh, electroweak precision measurements at the Z. Do you have an idea of what would be the change of the Z width if we change the, Z, the top TTZ coupling by 1%? Is it in the range of the, uh, the precision of 10 keV that we aim at at FCCE? No, we have compared these constraints to to other more or less indirect constraints that you get from from B physics and from from some of the lab measurements, but I don't think the the width was in there. Be the only free parameter there. If we uh, if we have the mass of the top, the mass of the Higgs, I mean the coupling of the top to the Z will be the only free parameter. So it might be um, a way also to measure this coupling. Okay, we can thank Marcel again and we move to